chaliced hands to the dregs towards the end. Hard iron on top. Hello, hi, and howdy. How's everybody doing today? I hope everyone is doing great. If you're new here, welcome. I'm so glad to have you. My name is Jenny. If you get anything out of this content, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and leave me a comment with your thoughts. Today's story is a suggestion from T.M. Nikki. And T.M. Nikki, if you see this, thank you so much for the suggestion. I've said this a few times, and I want to mention it again. I am not ignoring anyone's suggestions. I have a really long list, and I appreciate that. And I'm getting to them as quickly as I can. If you have a suggestion, however, that is personal, like a family member, please mention it in the email. I do try to move those ahead. Now, let's jump in. Tegan Alyssa Skiba, nicknamed Tegi, was born on the 6th of July in 2006 in Raleigh, North Carolina, to Helen Rays and Jerry Skiba. In Tegan's obituary, she was said to love the color purple, butterflies, ladybugs, and her grandmother's garden. Tegan's father, Jerry Lee Skiba, was born on the 1st of July in 1982, and Helen Roxana Rays was born on the 9th of June in 1983 in Harris, Texas. Jerry and Helen had a relationship and were together for a few years prior to Helen becoming pregnant. Jerry had an arrest history for illegal substances, both before and after the birth of Tegan. Shortly after she was born, Jerry was sentenced to spend time in North Carolina's Department of Corrections, and the relationship between Jerry and Helen didn't make it. Helen and Tegan moved in with Jerry's parents, Gerald and Sarah Skiba, in Youngsville. Gerald posted in one of the obituaries for Tegan that every Saturday morning, Tegan would say, the sun is shining, it's a sunny day. She would then request maple oatmeal. He further said that her daddy had bought her a pink car and she loved to play with it even after she outgrew it. She liked playing with her soccer ball, she liked finger painting, and she liked playing with clay. She was a happy all-around young lady. Tegan loved living with her grandparents and they were happy to have her. But before long, Helen met and began a relationship with Jonathan Richardson not long after they met in a nightclub. Jonathan Doug Richardson was born on the 18th of February in 1989 to Sandy Creech and Doug Richardson. Jonathan did not have a good childhood. In 1991, his mother hired a hitman to take the life of his father. Jonathan's father was shot three times at his front door, but he survived. His mother was prosecuted for conspiracy to commit unaliving. Her two co-conspirators, the hitmen, testified against her, but, but she was in fact acquitted. The couple did divorce, obviously. Doug won custody of Jonathan and Sandy would visit him on the weekends. Now, um, his father was described as being abusive and mentally ill, and Jonathan's mother was also said to be mentally ill. When Jonathan was in kindergarten, Sandy contacted social services and told them that Doug was abusing Jonathan. He refused to allow them to talk to Jonathan at their home, so they went to the school. Jonathan told them his father was hurting him. They had Doug sign a contract saying that he would not abuse his son anymore, and this is the second time I've heard of this. Remember, Adrian Jones' father uh, was also made to sign a contract. That just doesn't make sense to me, but... Jonathan was left in the care of Doug, and it was said that Jonathan was a good child and made good grades until high school. Prior to meeting Helen, Jonathan had a prison history with charges ranging from DWI and making threats, assault, destruction of property. In 2007, Jonathan became angry with his, at the time, girlfriend, and he busted out the windshield of her car. With his history, it's really no surprise that Gerald and Sarah was uneasy or wasn't happy with Helen's love interest. This started problems with Helen and Sarah, and this led to Helen taking Tegan and moving out of the Skiba home. This also led to Helen keeping Tegan away from her grandparents, who she loved, and they had helped take care of her. 
they were not able to have any communication with their beloved granddaughter because over the next few months, they tried many times to make contact to check on Tegan by telephone, but to no avail. Um, they said that they had considered hiring an attorney to attempt to gain custody, but decided against it. And this was because in North Carolina, as well as many other states, I know in Florida, grandparents do not have rights to the child. This was upheld by the Supreme Court, and under this law, they cannot seek custody unless they can prove with solid evidence the parents are indeed unfit. They knew Helen's training was coming up, so so they attempted to make contact with her to offer to watch Tegan while she was gone, but was only able to make contact with Helen's sister, who told them that the training was canceled, but that wasn't true. The couple, along with Tegan, lived in a like barn shed. It did have air conditioning um, behind Jonathan's grandparents' home in Smithfield, North Carolina, on Old Sanders Road. In the barn that was only air conditioned, they only had an air mattress to sleep on that laid on the floor. There was no running water, no bathroom. Almost immediately after moving herself and Tegan in with Jonathan, Tegan became the victim of CA. Helen claimed that she was afraid of Jonathan, but clearly wasn't afraid enough to get Tegan out of danger. Helen would later admit that she personally witnessed Jonathan force Tegan to to chug a Corona and two natural light beers. On the 6th of July in 2010, on Tegan's fourth birthday, Helen had to go to New Mexico to train with the Army Reserves. Instead of contacting the grandparents to watch Tegan while Helen was gone, she left now four-year-old Tegan in the care of her boyfriend, Jonathan. And I have said this so many times, and I'm going to say it again, I'm probably getting too repetitious with it, but please stop meeting people and allowing them to discipline your children too often. That does not work out, and it's just not their place. But 10 days later, on the 16th of July in 2010, Jonathan arrived at the Johnston Memorial Hospital in Smithfield around noon carrying Tegan, who was not conscious. He told the personnel at the emergency room that Tegan had fallen out of the bed. Now remember, all he had was an air mattress on the floor, and uh, what are those things, like three inches thick, maybe? Dr. Michael Evans was the physician on call when Tegan first arrived at the Johnston Medical Center. He testified that she had a faint pulse, strained breathing, dilated eyes, and was limp and lifeless when she arrived. He further testified that the main presentation was that he had a child that's been badly abused. She has head injuries and a bunch of other marks on her, but the immediate problem was the large amount of blood in her brain. The medical staff also noted 144 different wounds, including 66 bite marks, which were so deep that Tegan's flesh had been ripped off. One of her nipples was missing. She had cuts and bruises all over her little 40-pound body her arms, her legs, her back, and her stomach, and she was missing a fingernail. She also had small copper shards from the cord embedded in her little body. They also found signs of SA on Tegan. While the hospital staff worked diligently on Tegan, a nurse named Mary Butler spotted the man who brought Tegan into the hospital, and Mary noticed that he was attempting to sneak out of the emergency room, well, not on her watch, Mary testified, quote, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I looked at him and said, oh, my God. And I took off after him. I, I just couldn't take anymore. And so I looked at him. And I looked at him and I just, I said, oh, my God. I chased him down. I was running for everything I was worth. I caught him by the throat and I slung him around and was pushing for everything I was worth, end quote. She did a demonstration for the court on how she slung him around. She directed Jonathan into a room where he would wait for the authorities to arrive. She said, fueled by anger and adrenaline, that she asked for a pew-pew. She said, quote, I'm going to do what needs to be done right here, right now. And Mary, if you ever see this, you are a true hero. It was reported that one of the doctors told law enforcement, quote, 
you think about how bad you think this is and it's 10 times worse, unquote. The decision was made to transfer Tegan by helicopter to the University of North Carolina Hospital in Chapel Hill. Tegan was admitted into ICU and Jonathan Richardson was arrested for felony CA. He was held on a $1 million bond. At his arraignment, he was issued a public defender. When his mother and Helen arrived, Jonathan was overheard telling them that he loved Tegan to death and asked them if that was bad, and yeah. The doctors worked tirelessly all weekend to save the life of little Tegan. Deputy Matt DeSelva was sent to the hospital to investigate. He said he had to walk away. He said that what he saw was just too disturbing to even look at. He couldn't bear to see how this little girl had been treated. He cried on stand, giving his testimony of what he saw. Social workers took custody of Tegan, and her father was still incarcerated, and the mother, per social workers, abused Tegan by leaving her in the care of Jonathan. They further stated that it doesn't mean she inflicted injuries on Tegan. They said the definition 7B101 includes creating or allowing to be created a substantial risk of serious injury by other accidental means. Helen was allowed to visit Tegan in ICU. Monday, the 19th of July in 2010, Tegan succumbed to her injuries. She lost her life. Steve Bizzell of Johnston County Sheriff's Office released a statement that, quote, over the past weekend, a community, law enforcement officers, doctors, nurses, and medical staff has came to love a little four-year-old girl, Tegan Skiba, who was the victim of CA, end quote. He also stated that this was one of the worst cases of torture on a child that he had ever investigated. Jonathan was informed that the fell-off-the-bed story just wasn't flying. She did not get bite marks from falling from an air mattress, obviously. He then tried to tell him that her little cousin did it. Clearly, he was becoming desperate because he then blamed eczema. He then said that he did hit her with a cord, but only once, and that it hit her private area. He then told the investigators that Tegan urinated and defecated in the bed, and the bed that they were sharing, which is inappropriate anyway, and he lost it. He claimed he grabbed a drop cord and he whipped her with it. Investigators and prosecutors, however, say that this doesn't even begin to explain the injuries to Tegan. Jonathan then told the investigators that he was bipolar and little things seemed to set him off. Sheriff Bizzle said that he showed no signs of remorse. A search warrant was issued for the barn where Jonathan was staying. They took away a 2001 GMC pickup that Jonathan had used to drive Tegan to the hospital. They also took the air mattress, a condom wrapper, a shotgun, a rifle, ammunition, knives, duct tape pieces, a leafy substance, paraphernalia, guitar string, and a drop cord. Okay guys, this is fixing to get very graphic, so please continue watching with caution. Dr. Jonathan Privet, a assistant chief medical examiner in Greenville, North Carolina, said he observed injuries on Tegan's neck that were indicative of marks made by a power cord. He said that when they received Tegan's little body, her brain had been damaged so severely and there was so much swelling that the brain matter was starting to come out. Jonathan's charges were upgraded from CA to CA and unaliving, and on top of that, the grand jury also indicted Jonathan on charges of SA. Helen was also arrested for neglect. She admitted that prior to leaving town, she personally witnessed Jonathan beating Tegan. She also said that she knew of Jonathan forcing Tegan to drink alcohol and did nothing. She admitted that she had left Tegan with Jonathan while she ran errands and he sent her a picture of Tegan, and she was being made to hold a beer and cigarette. He said it was a joke, but it's definitely not funny. She also testified that she recalled an incident when she had left Tegan in the care of Jonathan, and when she returned, Tegan had a cut on her head. Jonathan told her that he had spanked Tegan for throwing up in a chair. There was also a photo found in which Tegan had a black eye. She said she confronted Jonathan and thought about leaving him. 
thought about. They all took a little trip to the beach. Again, Tegan had an injury on her eye, which Jonathan explained away to Helen as an injury from playing in the waves. Another time, Helen found whelps on Tegan and asked Jonathan about it, and he admitted to Helen that he had whipped Tegan with a cord. Y'all, I'm sorry if y'all start hearing a lot of noise. I guess everybody's waking up. Um, we have company because we're having a family reunion here uh, tomorrow, so they're down there playing on the pool table. But she claimed that she yelled at Jonathan not to ever do this again, and with this knowledge, she chose to leave Tegan with Jonathan instead of with Tegan's grandparents. She was given a $50,000 bond. Helen's sister also testified that she witnessed Jonathan grab Tegan and shake her to get her to be quiet. And I don't know how people think that this would work. You scare a child, you're not going to make them not cry. But Jonathan finally started talking. It was worse than anyone could have imagined. Um, Jonathan took Helen and dropped her off to head to New Mexico for training, and he and Tegan stopped at Lowe's on the way home. Jonathan would now go on a 10-day torture period with little Tegan. Jonathan stopped and purchased a padlock from Lowe's on his way home. This was so he could lock the door to the barn to keep Tegan from getting out or anyone else getting in, which kind of makes that seem like it's premeditated. He said when he realized Tegan had sold the bed, he was overcome with rage. Because he purchased the lock, it just doesn't seem like he just went into a rage out of the blue and hurt Tegan. But, per Jonathan, he grabbed the cord and began hitting Tegan all over her little body. He even made a video while he was doing this um, of her facing the wall with her arms spread out to the side and repeating over and over, when I have to pee or poop, I promise I will tell someone. And during that video, Jonathan's heard yelling at Tegan to speak louder, which she did. It was said there was also videos on the camera where Tegan was begging Jonathan to please stop hurting her, but this was not confirmed. She was also saying that she wouldn't have any accidents if he stopped. Jonathan was caught on security footage purchasing a first aid kit during this time. Since no one but Jonathan um, saw Tegan during this time, it is assumed that he left her home in the barn while he went to Walmart alone. On the 24th of February in 2014, which was a Monday, the trial began. Johnston County Prosecutor Paul Jackson began his opening statements by saying that the man on trial and facing the unalive penalty not only tormented and tortured and terrorized his girlfriend's four-year-old daughter, but he did this for 10 days before the child slipped into a coma and passed away while her mother was out of town. He reminded the jury that Jonathan Douglas Richardson is accused of first-degree unaliving felony CA kidnapping and essay on a child. I would like to point out real fast that by kidnapping in this case, it does not mean um, that he took Tegan from Helen without her permission. It means because she um, because he padlocked the door shut where she was unable to get out. But the prosecutor further explained that Tegan was confined into this locked shed. He inflicted pain and suffering upon this four-year-old baby, Tegan, through deliberate, repeated acts of sadistic abuse, not only physical, but essay. Not only for the purpose of discipline, but for sadistic pleasure. Paul Jackson then described Tegan's body as a crime scene with evidence of head trauma, essay, and more than 60 bite marks, as well as cuts and bruises, whip marks that were too numerous for the emergency workers to document and impossible to describe in words. He further let the jury know that at first, Jonathan lied about what happened to Tegan and tried to explain away the injuries, including telling authorities that the child fell off of an air mattress he was sharing with her, which again is inappropriate. When it was the defense attorney's turn, I assume he had nothing, as his opening statement was ridiculous. Defense attorney Jonathan Brown admitted and acknowledged that it was indeed Jonathan that hurt Tegan, but claimed that he, it was never his client's intent to take her life. He said that Jonathan didn't have the skills nor experience to care for a child. He further said, quote, 
Jonathan loved Tegan, but he was unequipped to care for a four-year-old as a 21-year-old could be. He had no idea how to care for a child, and his actions showed it, end quote. And I'm sure most 21-year-old men with no children would know innately not to beat and essay a child. The defense attorney went on to say that Tegan's um, unaliving was a result of Jonathan's own experiences of CA as a child, as well as undiagnosed mental problems. He went on to say that Jonathan was raised by an angry father who showed him little to no attention unless he was harming him. He said when Jonathan was beaten, at least he knew his father cared. His father was paying attention. Sadly, he said, Jonathan was taught that CA was what a parent did. It's how a parent shows they care and they love. Now, side note, a longtime girlfriend of Jonathan's father, Doug, said that Doug was a good and loving father and that Jonathan was a sweet and loving boy until high school when he began to show signs of anger. The defense attorney further told the court that while Jonathan did admit to the CA, he denies the essay. The defense attorney even went as far as to say, quote, Helen taught Jonathan that abusing her daughter was appropriate by her actions, by her approval when it happened. During the trial, I am going to add that Jonathan Richardson showed very little emotion. In fact, the only real emotion he managed to show was when Helen testified and pointed out at one point that she was in love with Jonathan. According to the defense attorney, Jonathan only wanted a real and perfect family, and there's no such thing. Nearly everyone to take the stand, the jurors, the family members, they all wept, but not Jonathan. Former crime scene investigator Charlotte Fournier showed pictures to the jury showing the little shed that they were living in and that it was cluttered and dirty. Remembering the details was so hard on her that she broke down and began to cry on the stand, so much so that the judge excused the jurors until she could regain her composure. Also to testify at trial was Jonathan's grandmother, who also was named Helen. She said during the 10 days that she went to the barn and found that the door had been padlocked. She knocked on the door and she heard Jonathan yell for Tegan to get away from that door. No one answered the door, however, and Helen, Jonathan's grandmother, admitted that she just left without alerting anyone that Tegan was possibly in grave danger. She claimed the reason she didn't alert anyone was she didn't want Tegan to end up being taken away from her mother. She did say she smelled urine and feces, but again, there was no running water or bathroom facilities. And you know if somebody's locked in a shed for 10 days, they're going to go to the bathroom. Miss Fournier further testified that the yard was neatly manicured that surrounded the 15 by 13 foot shed. The inside was filled with alcohol bottles, partially eaten food, scattered clothing, urine, and feces. She said the feces was scattered all over the floor and stuff was just threw on top of it. On Thursday, the 22nd of February in 2014, the jury, which was made up of seven women and five men, were shown crime scene videos from the shed. They were also shown the clothes that Jonathan and Tegan were wearing when arriving at the hospital. In all, they were shown 60 pieces of evidence on this day. They were also explained to that autopsy found Tegan lost her life due to blunt force trauma. Dr. Keith Kokus testified that she was minutes from passing when she arrived at the hospital. He said, quote, there was essentially no part of her body that was spared. That is something I have never seen. He laid out the injuries while photos were shown to the jury on the large screen. Dr. Kokus further explained to the jury that even if his team had been able to save her, due to the blood clot on her brain, she would have suffered severe injuries. Deputy Matt De Silva gave a very tearful and heartfelt testimony he told the jury that the sight of Tegan brought tears to his eyes. He said it was the most horrifying thing that he had seen done to a human, especially a child. Due to Deputy De Silva's cries, the judge called a 25-minute recess, and during the recess, Jonathan was seen smiling a lot. 
ER doctor Jeff Williams was then called to the stand. He testified that the injuries on Tegan were the worst he had seen. He said that the sheet was removed from Tegan and it was obvious that this child had been suffering for a long time. He said that he was aware she had a brain injury but not prepared for the side of the wounds that just covered this little 40 pound body. He said that this was when he realized the lower blood count wasn't from just her head. He further testified that the infections and injuries were at different stages of healing, which means they were inflicted at different times. A forensic dentist for 30 years, Dr. Richard Barbaro, testified that the bite marks matched Jonathan's teeth. He further told the jurors that he had never seen a child with so many injuries. Helen Reyes also took the stand and she explained that Jerry Skiba, Tegan's father, and Helen met in 2005 at Applebee's. She said when Tegan was born, Jerry became abusive and they split up. After the split, Helen met Jonathan. She further said she cared about him and felt as if she was falling in love with him. She said he was a father figure to Tegan and, and that Jonathan taught Tegan how to hook minnows for fishing. Helen also read a letter that she had previously written to Jonathan. It said, if I told you I love you too much, then tell me and I'll tone it down. You have shown me what it means to be truly loved and treated well. Helen, for future reference, if somebody's hurting your child, that's not treating you well. She said with Tegan, he was stern at times, but he showed that he loved her and he cared for her. Helen went on to say that she knew she was wrong for leaving Tegan with Jonathan. She never thought that she'd come home or get a phone call that something was severely wrong with her baby. She said, quote, I will live with this every single day of my life. I miss her every day of my life, end quote. The state then showed the video of Tegan where she was facing the wall with her arms stretched out, wearing a pink shirt and dark pants, and repeating the words, when I have to pee or poop, I promise I will tell someone. Also in the video, you could hear Jonathan yelling that the child better speak up. Obviously stressed, she did speak up and repeated the phrase four more times. The video was 37 seconds long and was taken at 2.31 a.m. on the 10th of July in 2010. The state contended that this was the last image of Tegan, conscious and alive. When it was the defense's chance, they wanted to play a video of Jonathan in the interrogation room to show his mental state when this all happened. The judge refused to allow the video submitted into evidence to be played in the presence of the jury, but, but he did dismiss the jury and allow the video to be played. It showed a tearful Jonathan on the phone with Helen telling her how much he cared for Tegan and how he wanted to have children with Helen when she got back. He told her he loved Tegan so much that he loved her to death. He told her, quote, you know my mind is messed up. Judge Locke ruled the conversation was hearsay, as you could only hear one side of the conversation. Dr. Donna Swartz Watts of Anderson, South Carolina, said that she determined after his arrest that Jonathan likely suffered from anxiety disorder, a mood disorder, and a substance disorder. She said, quote, he was irritable. He was in a situation where he was fishing for a reason to punish Tegan. But in terms of anxiety disorder, it is not related, end quote. After four weeks of emotional trial testimony, it was time for closing arguments. Both the prosecution and defense mirrored their opening statements with their closing statements. Nearly four years had passed since Tegan passed and Jonathan's fate was in the hands of the jury. They deliberated for only one hour before returning with a verdict of guilty on all charges. Jonathan only shook his head each time one of the charges was read. While awaiting the sentencing phase of the trial, it was released that Jonathan had numerous behavior issues such as inciting riots and threatening an officer. Then a shank was found on Jonathan after a guard was alerted by another inmate that he had it. Judge Locke ordered that Jonathan be shackled for the remainder of the trial for the people in the courtroom's protection as well as so he couldn't tried to escape. The jury deliberated for only three hours to make a decision on the sentencing, and they decided that Jonathan should indeed um, be unalived for his crimes. He showed no emotion. However, his family wept behind him. 
Gerald Skiba, Tegan's grandfather, was interviewed and he said, the way I see it, he got the verdict today, he should be dead tomorrow. He tortured my little granddaughter and she's never coming back again, end quote. Helen Ray's, uh, Tegan's mother, pled guilty to the Class C felony of CA and reckless disregard for the welfare of a child, resulting in great bodily injury. She was sentenced to 18 to 31 months in prison. Jonathan Doug Richardson is now incarcerated at the Central Prison in North Carolina. His inmate number is 1019362. He did file an appeal, but it was denied, and he still sits on North Carolina's Unalive Row, where he has been since the 3rd of April in 2014. On his prison record, he's only had one infraction since arriving at the prison, and it was on the 28th of October in 2021 when he threatened to harm or injure staff. Helen was sent to prison on the 6th of March in 2019, and her inmate number was 1605875. She was released from prison on the 1st of September in 2020. She completed her parole on the 29th of May in 2021. She did go on to have another child, and hopefully she'll protect this one. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of Tegan Skiba's very tragic story. And as always, rest easy, Tegan. Rest easy easy, baby girl. You are free. If you haven't done so and you get anything out of this content, please take a moment to like and subscribe and leave me a comment. And I truly appreciate each and every one of you. And until the next video, toodles.